at the bottom of your screen. At any time during the presentation or during Q and A. Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everybody's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 56,000 acres in our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you out there who are helping us to protect beautiful Sonoma County for all our future generations. As we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous people. We honor that their knowledge, their care and stewardship of the special place across the ages. And we acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land. Tonight, We'll hear from Kate Marionchild, who's the author of Secrets of the Oak Woodlands, Plants and Animals Among California's Oaks, which is from Heyday uh, Press in 2014. This classic of California nature writing is an engaging and beautifully illustrated romp through California's most life-filled plant community. With humor, affection, and scientific accuracy, Kate profiles the behaviors, the social structures, and anatomic marvels of familiar plants and animals found in our oak woodlands and their interrelationships. Kate lives in a yurt near Ukiah, surrounded by six different oak species and abundant wildlife. When she is not giving talks and guiding walks or observing nature, she swims, sings, and advocates for the preservation of native plants and animals. Everybody, please welcome Kate Marion Child. Thank you, Bob. So these days, I like to start my talks with something that I'm newly excited about. And about two weeks ago, I was sitting on a bench in my yard, idly looking at a small dead branch that had recently fallen off a live oak. It was very drippy out, as you might imagine or remember, and I couldn't see very well, but something caught my attention. This is the branch that I was looking at. I'm pointing at it now with uh, my uh, arrow. And at first I was just thinking, oh, that branch finally fell. When I noticed some bright spots of yellow amidst the darker rust colored blotches. And when I went over to check it out, sure enough, I saw that those bright yellow spots were the fungus known as witch's butter. I've seen witch's butter many times, but I was excited to see that they were growing on another fungus, false turkey tail. And before reading the winter issue of Bay Nature magazine, which I imagine many of you subscribe to, I hadn't known that one species of witch's butter is parasitic on false turkey tail. And in case you're not familiar with the so-called true turkey tails, they look like this and their undersides are white, unlike the darker undersides of false turkey tails. And by the way, this time of year when it's wet outside, it's really exciting to use close focus binoculars to get highly detailed magnified views of mosses and lichens like this shield lichen and fungi. This is another view of turkey tails magnified or bird's nest fungus. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's about one quarter of an inch in diameter. So this is an incredible photo by Kate Putnick. And those little things in the middle, the so-called bird's eggs in this nest, are the fruiting, fruiting bodies of the fungus. So my topic tonight is, the, is trees and shrubs of Sonoma County's oak woodlands and animals and fungi that depend on them. If you've heard me speak about the oak woodland plant community before, I hope you won't get bored, but hopefully you've forgotten everything I've said in the past. I've learned some vital new information in the last year from Doug Tallamy, who is the author of this book, The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. And 
I imagine that some of you are getting a little tired of hearing me say that oak woodlands support more biodiversity than any other terrestrial ecosystem in California. I've said that practically every talk I've ever get given. And so now you'll be glad to hear that you can now get tired of me saying oak trees support more life forms than any other plant genus in North America. And that the most important of those life forms is caterpillars. Caterpillars? Why? Well, caterpillars transform plants into animal fat and protein and other nutrients more efficiently than any other organisms. As you know, caterpillars are the larvae of moths and butterflies, and this is a moth caterpillar. And moth caterpillars are the essential survival food needed by most baby land birds. Many are smooth like this one, so they go down baby birds' throats easily, and they taste better than most butterfly caterpillars. Caterpillars are also eaten by a lot of other animals besides baby birds, and so they're the foundation of multiple animal food chains. On the far left is a list of all the bird families in which caterpillars are the critical survival food for baby birds, the North American birds. And everybody on these lists gets eaten by somebody who gets eaten by somebody else. So they're the foundation of food webs. And look at all the mammals that eat caterpillars. Who would have known? And if you are surprised to see bears at the bottom of this list, check this out. This bear is licking tent caterpillars off this tree. And in one day, this wild Minnesota bear ate 27,740 tent caterpillars. And over a week or so, she averaged 22 pounds a day of consumed caterpillars. And how do we know that? Because a re researcher actually followed her around collected all of her poop and counted the indigestible caterpillar skins in her poop. This is from a video that you can see online, which is why it's kind of fuzzy. So to support all the food webs that depend on caterpillars, we have to have the native plants that caterpillars can eat. And guess what native plant supports the most caterpillars? Yep, it's the oak genus. I've given a lot of talks now on oaks, how to identify them, their importance to other species. And in my book, I give deep glimpses into the lives of 22 of those species, like the iconic and endlessly fascinating polyamorous acorn woodpecker. And here is an acorn woodpecker actually with showing a, with a beak full of caterpillars for this baby. And I know this is a male acorn woodpecker adult because otherwise there would be a black band between the white on his forehead and the, and the red on the top of his head. So today I'm gonna to take a different approach and I'm going to focus less on oaks and more on the trees and shrubs that live in community with them. Most of whom communicate with and support each other through underground networks of mycorrhizal fungi known as mycelium or known as the wood wide web. So the fungal threads uh, that we see here extract nutrients from soil and rock and deliver them to the plants that need them most, increasing the nutrient up uptake of plants up to 100 times what their roots alone can supply them with. These mushrooms, oak chanterelles are one of the dozens of species of mycorrhizal fungi that partner with oaks and connect them to other plants. And notice the carpet of oak leaves around those mushrooms. Oak leaf litter is just about the best litter known to soil organisms. And because oaks don't lose their leaves all at once, oak leaf litter provides cover, hiding places, and moisture for myriad organisms year round. That's what makes it the best leaf litter. Most of those organisms are tiny, like springtails and mites and nematodes. 
In fact, one million nematodes can be found in one square meter of oak leaf litter. But there are also larger organisms that are so well camouflaged that we just don't see them. There are three in this picture. Can you find them? The one in the upper right is the most obvious. That's the California newt. And newts are often buried under leaf litter, and so we don't see them anyway. And then there's also a wolf spider in the upper left. That's right here. And right here is a litter moth caterpillar. And these caterpillars, along with about 10 of their brethren, eat nothing but dead leaves. Who would have guessed? So the message here is leave your leaves. Messy yards are in. You should harden your house against embers carried by the wind, but leave the leaf litter on the ground beginning about five feet from your house. If you don't, over time, the soil organisms will die, mycelium will suffer, the soil will compact, and your trees and shrubs will decline and eventually die themselves. Rich oak leaf litter is also a great place for planting acorns, which is what this California scrub jay is flying off to do. Jays have been co-evolving with oaks for 60 million years, beginning in Southeast Asia. An example of one of their adaptations is the ability to carry five acorns at a time. Almost all of the native oaks in Sonoma County and the rest of California have been planted by this one species. And the same goes for Mexico. Most of the oaks in Mexico, which is the world's center of oak diversity, have been planted by a close relative of the California scrub jay. But I mean, so the jays do a great job, but in the midst of fire, drought, habitat loss, climate change, and relentless browsing by deer, the jays need help. So I am urging you to plant and care for at least one oak tree a year, preferably more. I used rebar to hold these cages in place and so there are oak seedlings inside of both of these cages. And this is a ceanothus in the background. You can also just toss acorns into tangles of branches on the ground or into shrub thickets where they will be protected from deer, though not from rodents. Or you can look for volunteer seedlings and put cages around them. UC Berkeley has a good website with instructions for planting and tending to oaks. You also wanna give them a little water like once a month, a gallon or two uh, during the dry season for a couple of years. And if you have a lawn, please remove at least half of it and plant native plants. I know that's easy to say for me to say, but as Doug Tellamy says, lawns are deadscapes. And with plummeting insect populations and plummeting bird populations and everything else, we're in critical times. And if you don't have a patch of dirt for planting anything, plant native plants in containers on your porch or balcony. And this will help turn our towns and cities into wildlife habitat and corridors and into caterpillar paradises, which is what we need. And you'll be rewarded because your yard or balcony will be so exciting that you won't be tempted to watch TV anymore. To learn which native plants support the greatest number of caterpillars, go to calscape.org and put in your zip code. You put it in right here. This morning I put in 95404, which is an Inland Sonoma County zip code. And these thumbnails, which are also links, came up. Then I clicked on butterfly hosts right here. And this is about one quarter of what came up. So it was kind of overwhelming. But then I clicked up here on advanced search and I got this 
list of options, which shows only half of about only about half of the available boxes to check. And so you can see what I checked here, perennial herbal sun, low water requirement, very easy, easy care, and butterfly host plants, which that was a little redundant redundant. And then I hit search up at the top, which is invisible here. And this is what came up. This is much less overwhelming. Then I clicked on California goldenrod. And this is what came up. And I scrolled down and to where it says wildlife supported. And I learned that it hosts 39 caterpillar species, including three butterfly species. We care more about moths because they're better for baby birds, but it's fun for us to have butterflies too. So, so that's quite a respectable number of caterpillars, but I urge you to poke around in Calscape, Calscape for plants that support even more and see if you can find any that fit your needs. There are some plants that support 150 caterpillars. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to trees and shrubs of Sonoma County's oak woodland, starting with California buckeye. All parts of this tree, including its nectar and pollen, are extremely toxic. But when I took this photo in, in June, the flowers were swarming with native insects, beetles, flies, native bees, butterflies, who are attracted to the nectar and pollen. And the reason that's possible is that native insects have had millennia to evolve resistance to buckeye's toxins. Honeybees, on the other hand, who came here from Europe, have not had enough time, and buckeye's chemical defenses are disastrous for them. Adult butterflies and moths can consume the so called toxic nectar, even though it's not toxic to them anymore, of buckeye flowers. But very few caterpillars can survive eating buckeye leaves or flowers. So why is that? That's because once a caterpillar hatches out on a buckeye, it can eat nothing but buckeye because it's not mobile. Whereas adult moths and butterflies can flit around and sip a little nectar from one species and a little more nectar from a different species, and they don't get overloaded on any one chemical. And caterpillars have to eat enough buckeye leaves to increase in size by, or buckeye parts, in this case it's uh, flowers, to increase in size by a factor of 1,000 or so in just a few weeks. This is the only butterfly or moth, that, the, the only Lepidopteran that lays its eggs on buckeye. It's called the echo blue or Pacific azure butterfly. And instead of leaves, it, its caterpillar eats the bugs and flowers. So you may never have seen a caterpillar that looks quite like this, but this is the caterpillar and it's well camouflaged here by the pink flowers. So remember that pink for this caterpillar stage of the, um, the echo blue butterfly. Buckeye seeds are also toxic. These are the largest seeds produced by any plant native to the world's temperate zones. So you would think that every plant eating mammal would covet these seeds for their fats and proteins and carbs all contained in one big convenient package. But only two mammals can survive eating buckeye seeds. One is the Western gray squirrel who cavorts through an entire chapter in my book. And the other is the California ground squirrel, who incredibly has evolved immunity not only to buckeye's toxins, but also to rattlesnake venom. A, a, a squirrel that size can survive a rattlesnake bite that would kill a human. And I, there's another, there, I have a whole chapter on them too. So these two squirrel species, along with gravity and water, are apparently the only dispersers of buckeye seeds. The next tree I'm going to talk about is Pacific Madrone, and this curvaceous elder lives in British Columbia. I hope I get to see her someday. 
You may know this tree by its incredibly smooth reddish trunk and branches. It's the ancestor of manzanita and like manzanita, its flowers require bumblebees for pollination. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And if anyone wants to hear the whole story of how that pollination happens, I can talk about it in the Q&A. The large sweet berries of madrone are consumed by quite a few birds, including very thrush in the upper left and American robin on the right and northern flicker on the bottom and band-tailed pigeon. They're also popular with mammals like wood rats and mice, as well as raccoons and deer and bears, which this scat is a telltale sign. Deer eat young madrone leaves before they become too toxic and about 22 caterpillar species have evolved the resistance to the, did I say, yeah, to madrone leaves, including the caterpillar of the beautiful large Ceanothus silk moth. I wonder how many of you have seen these silvery mazes on madrone leaves. They're made by a caterpillar, the madrone skin miner moth, or I like the other name better, the serpentine leaf skin miner, that feeds just below the upper layer of the leaf. And you can see that the, the maze is narrow, the lines are narrow, narrow in some places and thicker in others. And that's because the caterpillar gets wider as it eats. So moth caterpillars are no, not only food for baby birds, they're also artists. And now I'm going to move on to California laurel, also known as California bay laurel, pepperwood, myrtle, headache tree, and about 12 other names. This tree's succulent little flowers are thought to be pollinated by flies and moths and the fruits in the upper right turn into nuts in the middle right that are called pepper nuts or bay nuts. They are a huge part of the diet of Stellar's jays in the upper left and squirrels below the jay in the fall, like in November. And they are the primary food of the California mouse, which is kind of hard to believe because they're so tough to get into. And they're also eaten by scrub jays, crows, wood rats, and humans. In my California Bay Laurel chapter, you can read about Ohlone and Pomo peoples who eat the nuts and also use the leaves for food, medicine, purification, and as non-toxic insecticides for preserving foodstuffs and clothing and baskets and other valuables. And wood rats use the leaves similarly at least the uh, insecticide part. They collect the leaves, nibble their edges, and scatter them around their sleeping chambers. They do this not for nutrition, but to release the volatile oils, which kill flea larvae, which plague wood rats. This sleeping nest is sorely lacking in bay leaves, though it is provisioned with its occupant's favorite food, live oak leaves. So California laurel, aka bay, supports hosts only three caterpillar species, including the western avocado leaf roller moth. So why, what do avocados have to do with Bays? Well, California laurel is a close relative of the avocado, and I discussed that in the bay laurel chapter of my book. And doesn't this bay fruit look like a tiny avocado? And here you can see how that, that the flesh also looks a lot like avocado flesh, but it's definitely an acquired taste, and there's only a narrow window of time when the flesh is edible at all. I don't think I know anybody who eats the flesh of bay fruits. So now I'm going to move into some shrubs that associate with oaks, such as toyon. Can you find the toyon in this picture? It's in the lower right. If you don't recognize it from this photo, which was taken in summer, you might from this one, which was taken in 
December. Toyona is also known as Christmas berry. But let's start first with the flowers. And while I'm talking, see if you can find any insects among these flowers. Toyon is in the rose family and its flowers are very attractive to insects. Toyon's primary pollinators are flies, who, by the way, are the world's primary pollinators after bees. In the case of Toyon, it's mainly hoverflies, which is what we have here in the upper left. And this is a honeybee, and I'm not sure what this is. In the, whoops, I was supposed to advance the slides. So this is the hover bee, this is the honeybee, and this is the unknown bee. Here's a closer look at that honeybee, which is one of 27 bee species that visit Toyon. The other 26 are native bees, of course. And these are ornate checkered beetles who visit Toyon for pollen. Ornate checkered beetles have a fascinating life cycle. This female will lay her fertilized eggs on the underside of the flower head. And after the egg hatches, the larva that emerges will attach itself to the leg of a visiting bee or wasp and hitch a ride to that bee or wasp's nest, where it will feed on the larva of the bee or wasp. Not a good way to return hospitality. So Toyon berries start turning from green to yellow around the autumn equinox in September, but you won't see birds eating them then, even after the berries have started to turn rosy. And that's because the berry's pulp is full of cyanide compounds. But when the berries finally turn bright red, their brilliant color says, come and get it, to the birds. It means they can see the color red. And that means that the cyanide compounds have retreated into the seed, making the pulp now safe to eat. And the seeds pass right through the bird's digestive tracts and get dispersed when the birds poop them out far from the mother plant. Mammals also eat toyon berries, which I'm, I'm, I'll name them in a minute. And they find out, it seems that most mammals can't see red. So it seems that they mostly find out that the berries are ripe by watching, by seeing all the bird activity at them. Here is a cedar waxwing eating a toyon berry in the upper left, and a robin is on the right, and a house finch is on the lower left. And the mammals that eat toyon berries include wood rats, gray foxes, bears, and coyotes. The berries are a really important part of coyote diets in winter. And did you know that insects are also a huge part of coyote diets in summer? And while I'm on the subject of coyotes, I can't resist mentioning that one of the small mammals that coyotes rely on heavily for food is the California ground squirrel. But they really don't like to hunt them alone. They go to great lengths to recruit badgers to help them. And McGlinte painted this illustration from my book from an actual photograph. And here are images of more images of the coyote badger relationship. And from various photos I've seen, it looks to me that like this isn't just a business relationship. It seems like these two species have almost an old shoe relationship with each other. You may have seen this video, which went viral of a coyote badger interaction that happened a few years ago in the Santa Rose, the Santa Cruz mountains. And I'm not going to play the video because I didn't have access to it. But in this, in this photo, the badger is off stage to the right and the coyote is playfully luring her along and now she shows up on the right 
and she follows the coyote through this culvert. And uh, she, if you, there are different versions of the video, but in some, you see them coming back through the culvert together also, supposedly mission accomplished. Because coyotes go in search of badgers when they have found uh, new ground squirrel activity. And it's thought that some scientists think that coyotes get the better end of the deal, uh, but it looks to me like badgers also benefit from this relationship because they seem so eager to pursue it. They're not being uh, coerced. Now let's move on to Manzanita. There are a whopping 116 Manzanita species in California, more than belong to any other native plant genus. Common Manzanita is host to about 54 moths and butterflies. It's a little different for each of those species. I'm not going to say a whole lot about Manzanita tonight because I have an entire chapter about them, about it, as well as a whole presentation dedicated to it. But Manzanita is fascinating for its thin skin that peels around summer solstice, its ability to photosynthesize sugars in its stems and branches. That's why this green, why you see green here, that's chlorophyll in the bark and for the fact that it is pollinated by bumblebees in the musical pitch we know as middle C. And that's uh, another thing I could talk about in the chat, but I think I already said that. If you want to, I mean in the Q&A, and if you want to hear, oops, I was just repeating myself. So both queen bumblebees and migrating hummingbirds organize their lives around manzanita's bloom time, and at least 23 bird species eat its berries. This mountain quail is one of them. I've only seen this bird once in my life, and it's utterly gorgeous. A whole host of mammals also eat the berries, including chipmunks, brown squirrels, and these these cheek pouches are stuffed full of manzanita berries, black, black bears and gray foxes. So last summer, there was a fox family that denned very near me and I saw a lot of this little fox. She's standing under a manzanita that I planted about 14 years ago. And during, in July on one warm, night. She even trotted into my house while I was temporarily outside and pooped on the floor. So over the years, I've seen lots of fox poop full of manzanita berries, but until this year, I had never seen a fox actually eating the berries. And here she is stripping them off the bush. And here she is on the edge of my narrow leaf milkweed patch, that's right here, and under that manzanita, which you can't see, eating them off the ground. Isn't she adorable? I just can't get enough of her. She, uh, I think what I read was that, she, I always saw her alone. And what I read was that young foxes um, start going out on their own, I think at about three months of age and don't have a lot more to do with their parents after that. So the next shrub that I'm going to talk about is poison oak. At least 53 bird species eat its berries, including the wren tit in this gorgeous watercolor that's in my book by uh, Anne McGinty, and this downy woodpecker in the upper right, and this northern flicker below the downy. And these, uh, John Davis is a photographer who 
photographer who has documented a lot of the birds that eat poison oak berries. But birds not only eat poison oak berries and seeds and forage in poison oak for insects, they also nest and roost in poison oak. And by the way, primates are the only species that get contact dermatitis from poison oak. This is the male poison oak bush that I fell in love with while I was writing my book. Now it's leafless in winter and it was more adorable in summer. But as I was writing my book, I was sometimes out of doors. And over the course of five years, I really started noticing and paying attention to this bush. Some of you will remember him from my book. He's the boyfriend whose hand I will never get to hold. And here are some of the birds I was jealous of because they got to nestle in his arms. This is a spotted towhee with the orange, a golden crown sparrow above the towhee and a scrub jay hiding way down there in the lower right. Here's a closer look at a, the golden crown sparrow. These birds fly every fall from their nesting grounds, which are often in Canada or Alaska, to here. And they come not only to the same region, but or the same county, but to the same yard and the same bush in that yard where they hang out with the same golden crowned sparrows as they hung out with the year before, unless some of them haven't survived the rigors of their migrations or their breeding season. And as we can see here, they too eat poison oak berries. And that is a poison oak berry in that bill, bird's bill at the very end there. So if you are at war with golden crowns because of how they decimate your vegetables, all you have to do is plant some poison oak nearby and they'll eat that instead. I actually uh, know people who planted poison oak in their yards after reading my book. Poison oak's tiny white clove scented flowers attract a multitude of insects like this honeybee, as well as various native bees, butterflies, and beetles. And beetles are probably the primary pollinators. Most people stay so far from poison oak that they never notice its little flowers or berries or the insects on them. But I urge you to edge as close as you can without exact, ex actually touching it. And if you have close focus binoculars, you can safely get exquisite views of the flowers, insects, berries, and the seeds, which are technically known as droops. And most of these have, still have their husks on, but those black grooves on the white one contain erushiol, which is the stuff that makes us itch. And I think they're very handsome berries or seeds, droops. After, after caterpillars, poison oak droops may be the most important food in California for, boo, for birds, and mammals also eat them, but most humans have never even noticed them. Poison oak is host to, and poison oak is host to seven caterpillar species, which was news to me because I've never seen a caterpillar on it, but now I'm going to be looking. So here's what those legendary close focus binoculars look like. And if I could buy one gift to help someone fall in love with nature, it would be these. I almost never go outside without them. And you can read about them and or buy them on my website, which would help fund my Oak Woodland protection and education work. Another shrub that you might want to approach with close focus binoculars when it's blooming is coyote bush. But is this bush in bloom? You might think the answer to that is obvious, but nope, it's not. The beautiful snow-like 
coops that we are seeing here are actually a sign that this bush has gone to seed. These little things right here are the seeds and these hair-like strands called papi enable the seed to fly away to start, the seeds to fly away to start new coyote bushes away from the mother plant. And this lesser goldfinch is one of the birds that eats and disperses the seeds, though they're mainly dispersed by wind. So coyote bush, when does it bloom? It blooms from mid-September through October or early November, depending on where you live. And it blooms when not much else is blooming. And that makes it a really important source of nectar for more than 200 insect species because they don't have any other sources of nectar then except vinegar weed and maybe some tar weed. And about 20 moth species use coyote bush as a host plant. It grows quickly and with pruning you can keep it looking pretty nice. So I recommend, especially if you need like a, a screen quickly, it, it can, um, it, it goes very fast. And if you visit it on a warm day when it's blooming, you can find bees and wasps and ants and butterflies and crane flies and true flies, including the bristly sci-fi looking tachinid fly on it. And, and do you know how to tell how to tell female coyote bushes from male coyote bushes? It's obvious. The female plants have ponytails and the male plants have crew cuts. So another shrub that is often on oak woodland edges or in openings is Ceanothus, sometimes known as California lilac. This particular Ceanothus species is known as Blue Blossom Ceanothus, and it hosts a whopping 93 or so caterpillar species, including the beautiful Ceanothus silk moth caterpillar. So here we are seeing the last three instars or caterpillar stages, which uh, these caterpillars go through on their way to spinning a cocoon. Dissolving, then dissolving into liquid inside the pupil case and transforming into a large, this large and beautiful adult moth, which we saw earlier. This is called Metamorphosis, and it was a 19th century woman named Maria Sedilla Marion, who is now considered the mother of modern ecology who was the first European anyway to figure out and illustrate the life cycle of caterpillars and the relationship between caterpillars and host plants. She, she sank into obscurity for, I don't know, a century or two, but she's now out of obscurity and you can find information about her and books about her quite easily. This is another, this is another instar of the echo blue butterfly. Here, this is the one we saw earlier when it was pink and here it's mostly green and it's trying to hide not in a pink flower, but in a green leaf by using its own silk to roll the leaf. And that's a trick used by a lot of, cap a lot of caterpillars. So this is a different instar from that previous pink instar or stage, caterpillar stage. But what the heck is this ant doing here? Well, many of the caterpillars of this family have a symbiotic relationship with ants. And this, this, the ants drink a sweet substance called honeydew, which is secreted by a gland in this caterpillar's abdomen. And in return for honeydew, which can extend the life of an ant from, get this, one day to 14 days, the ants guard the caterpillars. And when the caterpillars feel threatened by a, a predator, they make a sound that mimics the sounds that ant larvae make, and ants come running to protect them. So lots of insects are drawn to Ceanothus, the, the, the sweet scent of California lilac or Ceanothus. 
and um, here you can now see a larger image of a hoverfly in the upper right. And some of them, some of the some hoverflies have evolved to look like bees, probably because they're safer for, from birds that way. Another important Bay Area shrub is mountain mahogany. This is a sweet scented plant in the rose family, and it's not actually related to mahogany. It is named mahogany because of its hard wood, which native Californians use for tools. This unassuming plant is often overlooked until fall when its flowers have gone to seed and, and sprouted these long curling tails covered with fine hairs right here. And if wind blows these tailed seeds off the plant and it lands on new ground, nothing much happens until it rains. And then the moisture causes the tail to unwind, which drills it into the ground, drills the seed into the ground. This plant fixes nitrogen, basically fertilizing itself, and it stabilizes soil. It's browsed by deer and it hosts 31 caterpillars, including the mountain mahogany hair streak butterfly. Another Bay Area shrub that is a companion to oaks and to all these other trees and shrubs, either in the shade or sun, is coffee berry, which is named coffee berry because its seeds look like coffee beans, but don't get your hopes up. You can't get any coffee out of it. Coffee berry blooms in May and attracts a lot of insects, like this American lady on top. It's a butterfly and Larkin's Admiral below. And if you want to have some great insect sightings, make friends with a coffee berry bush. These are just a few of the dozens of insects Mark Cummel has photographed on coffee berry. These aren't all insects, however. This one is a jumping spider, and these are katydid eggs of all things. <laughs> I've never seen them in person. And these are pale swallowtail caterpillars, which use coffee berry as a host plant. And those things that look like eyes on a head are actually false eyes on a rear end. They're supposed to attract predators away from the head end, which is, of course, at the other end. <laughs> uh, the leaf on the left, notice that kind of uh, that whitish mat. It's a silk mat that the caterpillar has spun to keep itself from falling off the leaf. And I guess this is a, you can see that these two caterpillars look different. The one on the right doesn't have that black and yellow band and it doesn't have a mat. So I'm assuming that that's a younger instar and uh, the the larger instar had to spin that mat in order to keep from falling off the leaf. And this is the butterfly that that last instar caterpillar turns into after it first dissolves into liquid. The berries of, co of this lovely coffee berry plant often show up in four colors at once, and they're some of the only juicy fruits available for birds in the fall. And they are also eaten by wood rats, deer, bear, and other mammals. This plant hosts about 33 caterpillar species. And it's an excellent shrub to plant under oaks because it tolerates part shade. And whenever you plant native plants near each other, of course, they help each other through the underground mycelial network. This plant is also fire resistant. Uh, so I got through this talk a lot faster than I was expecting to. I edited it down a lot today because I thought it was going to take me a lot longer, even having timed it. So, um, before I close, I want to tell you that in addition to books and binoculars, you can find my laminated oak identification guides on my website. And they show or refer to all of the tree oaks of 
and all in one of the scrub oaks of Sonoma County. And along the bottom here, you can see certain oak galls that can help you identify an oak when you're otherwise stumped. So this is called the convoluted gall, and this is a, the club gall, and these two occur only on valley oaks. This is the speckled gall, and it occurs only on Oregon or Gary oak. This is the, let's see, um, Oh, I can see it, the coral gall, gall, and it occurs only on blue oak. This urchin gall occurs both on blue oak and California scrub oak. And this beaked twig gall occurs on California scrub oak and leather oak. And this is the earlier, younger um, stage of this one. This, this one has gotten old. So all of the oaks on this side of my guide are in the white oak section, it's called, or group. You can see that right here. And on the other side, uh, you can see three oaks that are in the red oak group, black oak, inter interior live oak, and coast live oak, and one oak in the golden oak group which is Canyon Live Oak. And uh, I just want to say that if you wish to buy my book, you can get it on my website along with these uh, oak guides and binoculars. And it's much better for me if you buy it from me, either through the website or by sending me a check than if you buy it from other sources. It's a difference between 50 cents or 70 cents a book for me and $10 a book. And now to finish up, I'm going to tell you about a night in the life of Lively the Wood Rat, who is a close friend of the wood rat whose sleeping nest we saw earlier. This is her nest. And here she has, like the other one, a sprig of interior live oak leaves for a noonday snack. Wood rat rats are nocturnal animals, so they spend most of the night up in the tree canopy, and then they come home to sleep in the day. And there is a little dung right here. Those two little sort of torpedo-shaped pellets are here from a day when it was cold and wet out and she was too tired to use her outside latrine. Lively doesn't share her mansion in the Madrones with any friends or family members, but she feels fine about the hundreds of uninvited guests that inhabit the peripheral areas of her house. In the interior, she has pantries and sleeping chambers and leaching room and, and sort of uh, temporary latrine areas, but most of her latrine areas are on the outside. But it's, and she has corridors and on each level there are openings to allow light and air into the rooms. There's sometimes a penthouse apartment. But on the periphery of her house, there are these uninvited guests, and those include mice and brush rabbits and newts and lizards and snakes and centipedes. And so here is Lively, now you get to see her, heading into her home at about 4 a.m. after a night out in the canopy. And she's feeling pretty good. Her food situation is secure. She already has nine pounds of scrub oak acorns stashed in her acorn pantry. And her berry pantry is well stocked with coffee berry, manzanita, madrone, and please and oak berries. She has plenty of mushrooms in her fungus pantry, and she has lots of her favorite leaves, live oak leaves, in her leaf pantry, along with ceanothus leaves, mountain mahogany, manzanita, coyote bush, and madrone. She has put the toyon and coffee berry leaves that she's collected, which are they're quite toxic. So she's put them in her leaching room to outgas before she eats them. She thinks she's going to sleep pretty well today because she won't be hungry, and her well-built house protects her pretty well from the 
skunks, bobcats, foxes, badgers, coyotes, bears, mountain lions, hawks, and owls who love to make a meal of her. But she's not quite ready to turn in for the day yet because she still has some housekeeping chores. She needs to remove that dung, take out the compost, and do something about the fleas because she doesn't have any bay leaves in her nest right now. So here she is taking out the compost, which is a dead light oak leaf that was in her regular leaf pantry. She takes it a little ways away and drops it on the ground and heads off into the canopy to collect some bay leaves. It's dangerous, but she's very smart and careful. And she returns safely to her comfortable castle with a few bay leaves. And, but she feels a need for one more sprig of live oak leaves to tide her over through the day in her bedroom. So she heads out again in spite of anxiety about the fox that she heard trotting by a little while ago. And she grabs some live oak leaves and hurries back just as the sun is starting to come up, carrying her sprig of live oak leaves. With a sigh of relief, she enters her house and takes the corridor that was gnawed out by her great-great-grandmother. And that corridor leads her to her cozy lower bedroom, which is now newly appointed with nibbled bay leaves. The smell of the bay leaves is pretty strong, but she's used to it because she replaces them every three days with new, with new strong smelling leaves. So I want to thank Lively for the important role that she plays in biodiversity by sharing her well-insulated shelter, climate-controlled shelter with so many animals. And Lively, may the fleas no longer be with you. And thank you, Sonoma County Land Trust, for all that you do to protect and restore the lands, plants, animals, and cultural sites of Sonoma County. And finally, I just want to show you some of my upcoming events. This is a list of walks and talks and interviews that I'm going to be giving. and. I'm not sure which ones of them are open to the public. So I don't have, um, I haven't said uh, the names of the organizations that are hosting the first two, for instance, but um, that's gonna be fantastic. It's about uh, the lives of North American dippers. And during the pandemic, I found two natural two dipper nests in natural locations, not, uh, not on bridges, which is where we often see them these days. And I did a lot of photographing and videoing of them, and I did a lot of research. I learned a lot about them, and I've learned more since I started working on that, those talks, that talk. And, uh, but I think this guided Oak Woodland Walk at American River Conservancy's Wakamatsu Farm is open to the public. That's in Placerville. It was, I, I just did one in November and that was open to the public. And then uh, these two in-person slideshows, both on the same day, morning and afternoon, one on oaks and one on acorn woodpeckers in Lake County. Um, may or may not be open to the public. So if you want to find out more about those, oh, and then I'm going to be leading a dragonfly walk on the peninsula in June, I think it is. Um, so if you want to be notified of my uh, events, please go to my website at katemarionchild.com and go to the contact page and leave me your name and also leave your, not only your email address, but the, the county you live in, because I don't like to publicize my in-person events to people who don't live fairly close by. 
So that's a way that you can avoid getting too many emails, which you don't get anyway from me. I don't send out very many. And um, so please don't forget to give me your county because otherwise I'm going to have to write you back and find out what county you live in. And that's all for now. Thank you for listening. Well, wow, Kate, thank you so much. Every time I go for a walk with you or hear you talk about stuff, I, it seems like you have a new fact or story to tell about the, the wonderful Oak Woodlands. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that show as much as I did. Remember, if you're interested in um, Kate's book or her close focus binoculars, the, the killer um, oak um, tree identification cards, just go visit her at katemaryandchild.com and you can get some great stuff. You can view this and past Language of the Land webinars if you go to Sonoma Land Trust's YouTube channel, which is really great. You know, we have a lot of great programs we've done over the past few years, so I encourage you to do that as well. And you can keep an eye out for our upcoming Language of the Land events um, at sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on the donations from individuals, uh, foundations, businesses, um, in order to make our work possible. If you like what you've seen here today, please consider donating. Uh, your gift helps support the land protection and the preservation and the restoration we do on our preserves and throughout the county. Uh, to make a donation online to Sonoma Land Trust, it's really simple. Just go to visit sonomalandtrust.org, click on the donate button, and there you go. Thank you so much. In these uncertain times, we appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. We are going to move into the um, question and answer part of the program right now. Um, if you folks have to uh, go, that's fine. Thank you very much for joining us. If you want to stick around and ask some questions, um, please enter them into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And um, we will, I'll, I'll scroll through them and we will um, toss them to Kate and we'll see what kind of stories and answers we get out of them. So bear with me a second. Let's see. What's the best seed sources, Kate, for um, native plants? Uh, well, there is um, the Calflora nursery in the close down where you guys live. Um, that is probably the best. There's also one over in the Central Valley that's really good here that I don't remember the name of. Here in Ukiah, uh, Mendocino College is a very good resource. And um, but the amazing thing about Calscape which I told you about um, is that it not, when you look up a plant, it not only has all sorts of information about what the plant needs for um, what it needs in terms of you know, exposure, sun, water, et cetera, but it tells you what nurseries carry it. it it's just incredible. And you can even uh, check one of those boxes to find out, I think about nurseries near your zip code or something. So uh, that's definitely the best way to find out what the best nursery is near you. That's great, thank you. Um, lots of interest here on folks about planting things um, as well as some of the animals. Let's see, do, do acorn woodpeckers swallow acorns whole to eat them or do they just carry them in their um, back to their granary trees? Well, no, they do eat acorns. And do they eat them whole? You know, I guess they must. I've never seen them. They don't have any teeth. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> they eat them whole, but they have gizzards, which uh, grind this, them. I assume they have gizzards. That's a funny, I've never even asked myself this question, but I assume they have gizzards like as many birds do, which are uh, muscular organs that are full of pebbles and sand and things and uh, and and so otherwise undigestible food gets ground up in the gizzard so a lot of people think that there's a, been a myth that's been going around for 100 and 
more than 100 years that acorn woodpeckers don't eat acorns. They just store them so that they can eat the grubs that are inside them, the weevils. And that's actually not true. They do eat acorns themselves. Acorns are a winter backup food for them. Their, their primary, their preferred foods are flying insects, mainly flying ants. Mm. But in winter, when there aren't as many insects around, they rely heavily on acorns. And in fact, uh, run the risk of starvation if they don't have enough. If, if somebody cuts down a tree, for instance, that's their granary tree and chips it up, um, they can be very, very, they can be in big trouble. I, uh, I'll, I could say quite a bit more about acorn woodpeckers, but maybe we should go on to another question. Okay. Well, in terms of supporting acorn woodpeckers, folks want to know, how do you grade acorns themselves for viability in terms of planting them? How do you know if it's a good acorn to plant? You put them in a bucket of water and you wait until some of them sink. And the ones that sink don't have air in them. So those are the viable ones. You can also shake them to see if they rattle. If they rattle, then that's uh, a sign that they're probably almost definitely not good. And you can also look to see if you have any, if they have any holes in them, of course, from weevils. Okay, wow, that's great. Occasionally, a weevil, I just learned this, can, uh, I think it was Doug Tallamy who said this in a recent talk, there can be some some acorns can be viable even if weevils have gotten into them, but most of them aren't. And you can almost always find intact acorns, so there's no point in even risking it. And I like to plant three acorns in a in the cage. Um, mm -hmm. So that, and then later I call the ones that seem less vigorous. That makes sense. How far apart, you know, should we plant? Um oak trees from each other? Well, it depends on what species you're planting. I would say, don't worry about that right now. Plant all the acorns, <laughs> all the oaks <laughs> you can. You can always cull them later. Um, some uh, oaks are more, they're smaller, like California, like scrub oak, uh, Quercus berberitifolia. And that one is one that I'm recommending for city yards. I, I don't know yet what it, what its roots do, if they make sidewalks buckle or anything, but they don't get nearly as big as uh, most of the tree oaks. They are they do get to tree size though, but they're more like a, 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 a big a, a big shrub. And I've never seen one with really huge limbs that could fall on a house. Oh, I gotcha. And they support, I mean, yeah, they're host to, I don't know, hundreds of caterpillars or maybe I, under 150, but a lot of caterpillars. So uh, I think that's a, a really good option. I think they get big enough to provide shade. I mean, I know they do. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Let's see. In terms of like some other plants, um, what about propagating buckeyes? One of our uh, folks in the audience has lots of seeds, but they don't quite know what to do with them. You ever propagated buckeyes? I haven't tried, but I have seen that they, in the wild, they almost always disappear. So what I would say, and that, that's probably from browsing, um, I think I think it must be from browsing, although it is toxic. But often, young leaves of plants aren't as toxic as they are when they as the leaves are when they get older. So, you know, I'm not quite sure why the buckeyes always disappear. But the best thing to do is not this wouldn't be the same as propagating it in your yard, bringing it in and helping it grow. But if you find them in the wild, I would recommend. Uh, experimenting with caging them. Okay, thank you. Let's see what else. Lots of questions. People, people are having a lot of fun. Someone missed uh, when you were talking about the wood rats, Kate. 
um, that they use bay leaves to deter some kinds of uh, larva or pests. Can you repeat what kind? Um... Flea, flea larvae. Flea larvae, okay. Experiments in laboratories. You know, it was noticed that they spread these leaves around their nests and they're, the leaves are nibbled, but they're not nibbled for the purpose of consumption. And so then scientists decided to test whether but whether bay leaves uh, kill flea larvae and in laboratory experiments, they killed something like 70% of flea larvae. Wow, that's, that's pretty significant. Yeah. Do you have a favorite area in Sonoma County that you like to go visit the plants and trees that you've been talking about? Well, I like Shiloh Regional Park quite a bit and I like Annadale. I don't actually get down there a whole lot. Well, guess what? I just saw a bat drop out of my bat house. I'm looking through my windows. And, uh, <laughs> what kind of bat was it? I can't tell that. Okay. Um, some folks um, were wondering whether the ant caterpillar relationship that you were talking about for the blue butterfly um, is unique, or do other caterpillars have similar relationships with ants? Um, many of the caterpillar species in the Lycenidae family have those kinds of relationships with ants. And in some case it gets, cases, it gets really wild. And, and these, this family, butterflies in this family occur all over the world. And I think it's in Australia where the ants actually build a little shelter at the base of the host plant. For the, for the butterfly caterpillars to pupate in. <laughs> and, and it's thought that the one that I showed you, the echo blue butterfly, may, the ants may take that, um, the pupa, I think it is, into their nest for protection while mm. what goes on inside so what, what goes on inside the pupa, the pupal case can happen in peace and an adult, adult butterfly can emerge, which I didn't, I was trying to save time, so I didn't talk about that, but it's so fascinating how the, um, the, cat, the last caterpillar stops eating inside its, and, and then transformations happen inside its skin it spins a cocoon and then inside that, it dissolves into liquid, but there are these imaginal cells that persist. Everything is liquid except these imaginal shell cells, some for the nervous system, and I forget what all the parts are that, that persist. And then the, the adult butter, and then those cells start multiplying and dividing and, and the, adult butterfly comes out of out of that. And one other really interesting thing is that caterpillars, um, they've done tests with caterpillars where they expose them to noxious smells while shocking them. And they tested to see if adult butterflies remembered that by exposing the adult butterflies to those noxious smells, and they did. They, they, they had aversion to the noxious smell. So that, that awareness persisted through total dissolution into liquid. Wow, that's, that's great. Nature is amazing. I wonder how that evolved over time. Yeah. Um, talk about chicken and egg. Um, <laughs> yeah. Getting, you know, moving away from kind of the, the concept of individual plants to more like habitats. Do you have any thoughts about uh, Douglas fir moving into oak woodlands? Yeah, a lot of thoughts. I hate <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's widely recognized now that fir encroachment is um, is not good for oak ecosystems because uh, firs don't support as many uh, species. The biodiversity just plummets when firs take over oak woodlands. So I am all in favor of removal of Douglas firs in lands that have historically been oak woodlands. 
Okay. Um, can you say a little bit more about galls and the oak galls that you showed on your, on your ID cards? What are they? Oh, yes. I love to talk about galls. So a gall, so let, let's talk about oak galls. So an oak gall comes into being when a wasp, a tiny, tiny wasp, most of them sm small, smaller than fruit flies, lays an egg on growing oak tissue, like on leaves or leaf veins or twigs. And that egg hatches out, a, a caterpillar, I mean a larva hatches out, a wasp larva. These are harmless wasps. They don't have stingers or anything. So a wasp larva hatches out and it starts munching, let's say, on a leaf. And as it's munching on the leaf, it secretes hormones that mimic the tree, the oak tree's hormones. And it fakes the tree out. Now the tree hasn't been happy being munched like that. And it would it wants to wall this little irritant off. So it responds by creating a structure called a gall. But because the it's being directed by the hormones secreted by the gall wasp larva, it creates a structure with a chamber inside, or sometimes multiple chambers for, for multiple larvae. That are, and these chambers are lined with food that the larva can eat. And so this structure protects the, the gall wasp larva from predators while it's going through its metamorphosis of four or five stages and then pupating. And then it finally, uh, and then an adult wasp hatches out, usually inside that chamber and it chews its way out. So those big balls that you see on, mostly on valley oaks and Oregon oaks, white oaks, uh, those are galls. And those are the biggest galls we have in the West. And those are condos. They have multiple chambers inside them. But there are a whole lot of smaller galls that are really colorful, like pink, like you saw in that coral gall that was uh, yellow orange. And um, some, of time, some of them are really, really tiny. And if you start looking on leaves in the fall, um, especially on blue oak leaf, um, blue oaks and on valley oaks, you can find a whole bunch of different kinds of galls. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a lot more to that story, but I should probably stop now <laughs> on that subject. So that's what that's a gall is. That's great. That is super cool. And they're and they're considered now to be a keystone species. They're uh -huh. they're they're the galls themselves are used by a whole lot of different insects over time. Some the, some of those big apple galls stay on trees for as long as four years, and after the gall wasp exits, uh, other insects move in, and um, birds eat, they peck into the galls to, to get the larvae to eat. And this, what I don't know if any of you have ever seen uh, what look like sort of Mexican jumping beans on the ground. Those are jumping oak galls and they're tiny, but they have a little larva inside that is flipping around with the goal of trying to find a crevice in which it can safely um, pupate and emerge. Wow. Um, someone was asking, they have the many of the plants you've talked about, um, but they don't see these insects and caterpillars and birds, um, you know, in these kind of the suburbia. Um, are they present, you know, close inland or can you only find these kind of things um, when it's in a wilder location? No, you can find them if you're looking on native plants. but. Um, you have to, one, one good way to find them is to look for leaf damage, because that's a clue that somebody's been feeding on the leaf, and often it's a caterpillar. 
And it also depends on the time of year. Like I also don't just see them in huge numbers. I have to look pretty hard. But one time I was camping under some blue oaks up uh, in, outside of Potter Valley. And uh, I was there for about five days and I had a table set up that was my cooking table and it kept getting littered with what looked like pepper. And it was the poop of caterpillars. And I would sweep it off and pretty soon it would be back. And there were all sorts of caterpillars hanging from threads, from silk threads. So if you ever see those iridescent silk threads, that's probably a clue that there are caterpillars dropping down out of trees, which they do both to avoid predators and sometimes to disperse. Okay. So look for leaf damage. Um, look for leaves that are rolled over and don't open them up because there is probably going to be a caterpillar or a pupa in there and you don't want to disturb it. But you have to know what to look for. And they're often really well camouflaged. I guess that makes sense. Otherwise they get eaten up. Um, someone was curious um, about when we were talking about the different rooms in the interior of the wood rat nests. How did you learn about the mansion without disturbing it? Oh, well, uh, uh, I didn't disturb. So that particular mansion was not, uh, that, that mansion isn't a mansion that I've ever actually seen. I kind of combine things. I recently uh, un uncovered and relocated a wood pile. And so I found a wood rat nest in that. So I photographed it and I actually nibbled those bay leaves <laughs> I put in there and photographed it before and after be with the oak, the oak leaves and then the bay leaves. So, but I know about other people have dismantled wood rat nests for one reason or another. Like in my book, I tell the story of a, a man here in uh, Mendocino County who had a wood rat nest in a spot he didn't want it. And he dismantled it. And he found that, you know, wood rats are also called pack rats. And so he found that there was a penthouse apartment and the ceiling. And so wood rats steal things from humans. So there was a penthouse apartment with a CD as the ceiling with the reflective side down. And then when he got down to the, um, then he, and then he realized this, anyway, you can read my book to read about that. But a lot of researchers have dismantled wood rat nests. And I did a whole lot of book research and internet research while I was writing my book. And so. they, they don't, get to be big mansions like that very quickly. It takes many, many generations to make a mansion like that. So no, no wood rats were harmed in the making of that video? No. <laughs> Someone well, wondered, okay. could you repeat the Beatles story that's a parasite, the one about hitching a ride? Oh yeah, so that's the uh, spotted tiger, wait, tiger beetle. Yeah, so it um, lays its eggs on the undersides of flower heads. And then the egg, an egg hatches out, a larva comes out, and then that larva lies in wait for a bee or a wasp to come along. And then it hitches a ride, it attaches itself to the leg of that bee or wasp and hitches a ride to the bee or wasp's uh, nest. And there it parasitizes the larvae of that species. Wow. Let's see. Um, someone asked if um, Mexican oak woodlands are comparable to those in, um, uh, in Sonoma County and beyond locally. Well, I... I haven't actually experienced Mexican oak woodlands myself. What I can tell you is that um, of all the countries in the world, Mexico has the most numbers of oaks, of oak species, 
And it used to be, the number used to be 180, and I think it's been demoted since uh, a new survey was done. And then uh, the next most oak rich country is China with something around 100 species, and then uh, the United States with 90 or so. And, uh, but as far as the numbers of well, white oaks versus uh, red oaks or live oaks versus deciduous oaks, I don't have any idea. I would, I'd love to know. I, mean, I don't know, I wish we could ask somebody in our audience. Well, if anyone in the audience knows that question, you can put it in the Q&A and Ingrid will find it. Um, which oaks are good on the coast? Which would like prefer like the colder, foggier kind of environs? Well, the coast live oak is the one that is um, most common on the oak, on the coast. And um, although it doesn't live north of someplace like Anchor Bay or, or, or so for some reason. And so coast live oak and then tan oaks, and, and both of them don't go quite all the way to the ocean. I don't think, but, um, and tan oaks aren't true oaks. They are cousins of true oaks, uh, but they do produce acorns and they're very, very, very as important as the true oaks to the ecosystems that they inhabit. And okay. yeah, I don't, yeah, you know, I haven't lived on the coast with oaks. So that's another one where somebody else would know better than I do. But, well, here's what you should do. Go to Calscape and there's a map. So you could put in each of the different oaks and look at the distribution map that comes up of the native range. And that's, that's how you could get a good answer to that question. Well, thank you, Kate. That was an amazing presentation. We have lots more questions, but I'm afraid that we ran out of time for this evening. Darn, I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess so, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, and maybe you could come back again and, and share more stories with us. I'd love um, to. I'd I just uh, I'm, I'm my mind is reeling with all the all the all the interesting tidbits and everything. Thank you so much. You're very um, I'd also like to thank um, Mariana for interpreting yes, this program. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. It's um, we couldn't do it without you. Um, you had really great comments, really great questions. Thank you so much. You um, have a good have a good evening, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.